So perhaps I could start, please, with Gernich, who's a partner at um, um, uh, ELIG um, in, in, in Turkey. Perhaps you, um, I'll hand it the floor to you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Alison. Uh, much appreciated. So um, uh, th this is definitely not an easy um, uh, field uh, of uh, regulation. So I, I would uh, say that it's very, very hard to say that there is a consensus about uh, the need for, a, for new regulation. Obviously, people who uh, push for the new regulation uh, have a sense of urgency and they're, they're fearing tipping possibilities and they're fearing that um, it'll be too late. Uh, but uh, um, there are very many concepts that need to be balanced in this particular field. So there is urgency in one hand, but you need to, uh, to balance it with the need for counterfactual analysis, the need for uh, um, taking baby steps at certain times so that uh, you understand the effect of your own enforcement. There is a need for resolute and assertive agencies for sure, but uh, you can't afford them being opinionated. Uh, so under the banner of being resolute and assertive, if the agencies were to cross a line where they, they start being opinionated about the, uh, the uh, players in the, the digital markets, then that's going to be a, a, a problematic balance. Again, you wanna be quick and nimble, uh, it's true, but you don't. You also want to be equitable, and uh, you want to uh, make sure that uh, the just results are provided. So uh, I think um, there is much to be discussed, and it it would not be a correct summary of the current status to say that there is convergence and consensus that uh, new regulation is needed. It is possible to stifle innovation with new regulation. Uh, and easy labels will not solve this problem. Um, it's true that competition uh, drives innovation and not monopoly. And, uh, you know, as a quote unquote sentence, everyone would uh, under, you know, underwrite that, that sentence. Or you can say that the fact that you have a, a great product is not a carte blanche or a categoric exemption from competition law enforcement. That's a correct sentence, definitely. Uh, but these don't solve our issues. Uh, these sentences are correct in and of themselves, but ultimately the matter is way more complex than that. Uh, and uh, uh, it is possible to overregulate certain industries where um, with those regulations and the, uh, uh, the results of those regulations, you might be actually stifling uh, innovation. And, and the worst thing is uh, there is that, uh, that sliding door moment uh, where you won't even know that you may have uh, stifled innovation. So um, it's very important to do the counterfactual analysis uh, with concrete uh, facts and parameters and data uh, before engaging in uh, sweeping uh, uh, acts of, of regulation. Um, otherwise, we may find ourselves in, um, uh, in uh, uh, subsets of big is bad kind of uh, uh, approaches. Uh, I've already, I, I think, heard uh, uh, Mike Walker say uh, we need to limit the market power, um, and that that in and of itself sounds like big is bad to me uh, because you know normally you would try to avoid uh, the the use of market power in a given way, but you wouldn't concern yourself with limiting market power as such per se. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we need to always uh, recognize that while cost of not regulating might be high, and there may be a case in favor of uh, uh, regulation, uh, cost of perverse regulation could be even higher. Um, I know that this is not very helpful in terms of putting something forward, and there is a, a feeling of, of urgency, especially in the digital markets, because of, uh, of tipping um, ideas. But we need to also observe what has been happening to antitrust law uh, recently. I've been in, in antitrust law for 25 years. Um, there are people attending this panel um, who have way more decades than that. Uh, under their belt, 
And uh, we can all observe that antitrust law is actually reacting to what is happening. We are using terminology that wasn't there. We're using self-preferencing. We're using tipping, gatekeepers. Uh, these are all things that have been produced by the antitrust jurisprudence to, uh, to deal with uh, matters that are thrown at it. And I don't think antitrust law has been inadequate uh, in such an extent that there has to be uh, a sweeping regulation. Uh, it's just that uh, antitrust law also is factoring in um, the need to evolve together with uh, all the innovation uh, and the uh, technological advancement that is happening. Um, I'd also say that it is very important to note what all this is doing to emerging markets and other uh, authorities that don't have as complex uh, enforcement as what you see in uh, Japan with the JFTC or with the CMA in the UK or in the United States. I'm not, so I'm coming from Turkey and I have a law firm in Turkey, but I'm not uh, belittling uh, the Turkish Competition Authority with what I'm saying. In fact, they have more than uh, 20 years under their belt uh, and they are a, a, a regional uh, serious competition authority. Uh, but in general, when I look at the emerging markets, I'm seeing that there is a big hype about going after the digital uh, players as well. Uh, and not all of them have the same understanding of the technology. Not all of them have the same economic analysis tools available to them to uh, determine uh, the effect of a given uh, uh, step that is taken. So uh, when uh, taking certain steps of regulation, um, we should also uh, uh, understand, I think, that uh, those steps of regulation might lead to categoric uh, waves in other places of the world. And this might really be detrimental for uh, technology, which is in and of itself uniting. Uh, we've seen it in some other uh, uh, fields of law as well. The, the right to be forgotten, for example, uh, a new generation right when it came in into gameplay in some other jurisdictions, it has meant uh, something and, it, and there was a virtue in it. But when it was uh, imported by some other jurisdictions that weren't uh, as solid on fundamental rights, suddenly the right to be forgotten was hijacked into something that is whitewashing everything. Uh, so uh, we need to be careful with uh, sweeping regulation in more developed and sophisticated regimes because these might lead to sweeping reflexes that were not intended in uh, other jurisdictions and that would be equally harmful uh, to the advancement of technology uh, globally. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much for those comments. Could I now hand over to um, Elizabeth Wang, who's Executive Vice President at Compass Lexicon, uh, based in Boston and Beijing. Thank you, Alison. Um, uh, it's a really interesting and timely debate uh, of whether and uh, uh, the, the cost of platform regulation and the cost of not regulate the pla uh, platforms. Um, so I want to offer um, my observation from China's perspective. Um, what we know or what we have heard now from the Western world is mainly Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon. But in different geography and also within um, uh, our economy, there are many platforms that more than those GAFAs. And, uh, and not all the platforms are the same. Um, so I'll give you example. Um, why China is particularly relevant is just, just especially for this debate. Um, in China, there are uh, more willingness of taking regulation uh, into different space. And two weeks ago, literally two weeks ago, um, the Chinese regulators from three different uh, ministries have organized um, a meeting that invited 34 
platform companies to discuss regulation in platform space. So those 34 platforms, um, they are in a, a wider range of uh, uh, services. For example, um, gaming platforms, travel platforms, um, uh, food delivery platforms, um, and um, um, realtor information platforms, and, and just to name a few. So every platform, they have their own characteristics and they have their own issues and, and business models. Um, my sense is uh, when Mike uh, talking about regulation, the devil is in the detail, and you're absolutely right, it's how. How do we even carry this out? Knowing that platforms are quite different and have different um, uh, users, have different type, type of services and business model they have to operate. Another aspect of, of how that's particularly challenging in the uh, platform regulation is that the, the dynamic and disruptive nature of many of the entities, they're just new and they would offer something completely different uh, from our traditional business have been looked at. So how do we take that into account? And the concern um, is as a platform regulation, a, a one size fit all most likely would not be able to uh, flexible enough and take into uh, all this new and dynamic um, aspects of, of platforms. Um, my second observation is that um, the regulation, um, how would the regulation take into account the competitive effects rather than the basic uh, structure type of factors? Um, we have very well established uh, antitrust economic theories and uh, empirical methods to help and develop, to test those anti-competitive conducts and their effects. And many of them, can be used into the conduct we observe of uh, techni technological uh, digital platforms. So for example, in China right now, the most, um, uh, the, the conduct that grabbed most attention among the platforms is um, a, a type of con exclusionary conduct that one of the big platforms such as Alibaba, Tencent, or TikTok. And they have imposed restrictions on who their platform uh, participant might involve or participate in other platforms. So those type of conduct, um, even though they're carried out by digital platforms, but they are quite typical conducts like what we have studied in many decades in antitrust case laws. And we have well-established framework, economic evidence, and to, to understand um, when and where those conduct have pro-competitive effects and when and where they have anti-competitive effects. So we just want to make uh, offer that um, even for platform uh, regulations, um, there may be still a lot of room allow us to look at the competitive effects rather than just uh, a ex ante regulation. Uh, let me get back to you, Alison. Thank you very much for those um, very interesting observations. So um, before we um, open the floor for a bit more debate and, and questions, let, um, um, I just invite Al Kalyani Singh to make some comments and observations and Kalani is a public policy manager at Facebook um, in, in Delhi. Thank you, Alison. Um, good, mean, good morning, good afternoon and good evening um, to everybody. And thank you for having me on the panel. Um, it's been a very interesting to hear um, views across the board. Um, I'm gonna start with a little bit about uh, developments in India first. Um, so, um, India, uh, in comparison to uh, the panel here, uh, happens to be the newest or the youngest sort of competition jurisdiction. Um, so far, it's still in its early teens of enforcement. 
Um, and, um, and in that sort of, uh, but having said that, it's always been a sort of a very, and, but it has taken strong enforcement. It has had strong enforcement priorities and it has not shied away from enforcing competition laws. Um, in 2018, the Competition Commission of India um, and the government did an entire, uh, reviewed the competition laws and the adequacy of the Indian legislation uh, with respect to the changing economy. And one of the chapters in the review committee was in fact, uh, the new age and the digital markets. And sort of an overall observation in uh, that report was that the current sort of legislation is sufficient uh, for the CCI to address digital markets from an enforcement perspective, but they have sort of um, proposed changes to the merger rules to change the jurisdictional thresholds, uh, proposing a change in the jurisdiction threshold requirements. Uh, but overall, there seems to be a general consensus that the current antitrust rules um, are sufficient for digital markets. So I am going to go with sort of um, in this school of thought, I am going to go with uh, deferring on the sort of like convergence of the change in rules uh, to address digital markets, because um, India is one of the jurisdictions uh, which sort of shows that uh, they do consider the current rules sufficient, more or less. Um, now, uh, having said that, I do want to take this, uh, I, what I want to talk about a little bit is um, the, as we've seen, there seems to be um, a lot of scrutiny on digital markets in general, and uh, a sort of reassessment of uh, sufficiency of competition tools and standards regarding the digital markets. And overall, um, while the regulatory proposals and interventions seem to differ, um, there seems to be a basic broad presumption of digital markets, um, uh, which is the basic premise of these regulatory discussions. And um, broadly speaking, these are digital platforms uh, exhibit strong network effects, digital platforms have data-driven uh, data driven advantage, and digital platforms um, are prone to tipping or market entrenchment. And I do want to unpack these a little bit um, in the hope of showing that an unequivocal uh, reliance on these presumptions and understanding could in fact uh, be a somewhat oversimplification of uh, the actual realities in these markets and models. Um, and so when we talk about network effects, there seems to be a sort of positive correlation between the size of user network and the strength of network effects. And in that sense, um, what evidence actually seems to suggest is that size of user network, uh, a size of user network may not necessarily um, positively correlate to the strength of network effects. Uh, for instance, when there are cluster of users, and in those situations, um, users for, for the user, uh, the cluster matters more than the size of um, a firm's uh, than size of the user network of the firm. And so, in that sense, um, the incumbent size of network sort of fails to insulate it from any competitive threat for, for instance, a new entrant entering and targeting a cluster. Um, the other one is on um, the data-driven competition, uh, the data-driven competitive advantage, which seems to, so what uh, basically seems to be said a lot is data accumulation uh, and data aggregation is a short, short path to monopolization. And, um, and in fact, uh, and which sort of implies that data creates entry barriers. And this is also necessarily not true. And one of the reasons behind it is that data is one of the many factors based on which digital platforms compete. Now, I don't want to undermine and say data is not important. Data is important. Data has advantages. But um, it's also important to bear in mind that it is out of all the factors that are used to compete in the market, it is ultimately one of those factors. And in fact, uh, market evidence does suggest that there have been successful entries of players who've entered the market without data. Um, so in social media space, TikTok and Snapchat are excellent examples for uh, social media globally. India itself over the years has seen successful entries in social media. Um, to name a few, um, uh, 20, in 20, uh, 2016, there was ShareChat. 2018, there was a video sharing app called Shingari. 2020 itself saw two successful launches of um, Koo, which is a microblogging site, and Mitro, which is again a short form video sharing uh, media app. So in this sort of like 
Um, and so here, the sort of uh, understanding the data is the new oil and it creates entry barriers is somewhat contradicted by real market evidence. And then uh, the third one being that digital markets are prone to tipping and market entrenchment. This again, sort of like evidence suggests that this is also not um, as certain as current regulatory debates seem to indicate in markets. And one of the strongest sort of countering factors, which are typically seen that sort of weaken um, entrenchment is uh, multi-homing. Um, now, I don't want to talk about what multi-homing is, but I think it's worthwhile to discuss a little about what multi-homing actually implies. And what multi-homing implies is that where there is multi-homing, a digital service is incapable of capturing a user completely. So what the digital service is able, so what happens is that the digital service can get a user, some of the user's time. And this coupled with differentiated competition, what leads to, uh, could lead to a fact where uh, users choose uh, a specific service for one purpose and then can choose another service for another purpose. Now, um, in light of all of this, I think what, what needs to be considered when developing regulatory frameworks for digital markets is that there needs to be at least an accommodation for um, economic analysis of these kind of countering evidences of multi-homing, user heterogeneity, and switching costs, which are important sort of factors which weaken the sort of set presumptions which are currently prevailing in the regulatory debate. And without having that flexibility, it sort of leads to, um, it may sort of lead to somewhat of a distortion of, um, of the ground realities. Um, and the other one that I wanted to talk about is there is, is, is a question on if in fact there is something currently missing from the regulatory debates and conversations. And I think um, the value creation aspect of platforms has not received sufficient regulatory attention in these sort of discussions and does require a lot more thought. Um, and primarily because, um, and so in this, for instance, um, the value flow are not properly sort of talked about or discussed, um, especially value flow from data um, is not sort of, uh, has not received that much uh, sort of discussion on um, the role of data as a source of value and innovation, which is in fact an integral part of how digital platform markets work. Um, then again, the innovation processes um, are not usually represented that well in these discussions and um, a competition from new entrants as well as existing digital players are sometimes underestimated in having these discussions. And so essentially uh, what I'm trying to say is that if we are taking sort of a holistic uh, approach of, uh, platform, of regulating platforms, then we do need to understand how value is being created and shared by platforms currently. And so um, in this, at the risk of sounding trite, um, digital markets are complex. Um, they are sort of dynamic and constantly evolving. And so any regulatory framework, which is kind of focused on digital markets needs to have some level of flexibility that can accommodate for learning and correction, um, especially because it's still uncertain that we've received, that we have the level of analytical understanding um, to approach predictive capabilities. And so till we reach that, at least there has to be some level of dynamic legislation for the dynamic markets as well. Um, and on that, I have, I was a little influenced by um, Dr. Walker's articulation of some points. And so just to point that out on, uh, so just on, on some of the points from um, the other side of the coin is, um, it is not controversial that platforms generate value for users. It is also not controversial that digital platforms have an incentive to innovate and they do invest heavily in um, um, cutting edge products. And um, it is also, and I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that it is also not, it is also pretty well recognized that there are in fact competitive constraints um, which sort of need to be addressed. And so if the basic objective is to have a sort of um, regulation or regulatory framework uh, which is balanced in the sense that it addresses harms plus preserves value created by platforms, I think we do need to have space to have these sort of like factors also taken into consideration when creating regulatory designs. Um, so I'm just going to pause there and um, give the mic back to you, Alison. Thank you. 
Well, thank you for those in, uh, incredibly interesting comments. So I think um, we've got a number of questions coming in, which I'll invite um, people to present in a minute. But I just wondered before we did that, whether uh, Rico or Mike or um, Christine would like to comment on any of or um, um, respond to any of those um, observations. So I think we've had some sort of challenges to the views of there's a con consensus about the need for it and how we do it in particular. Um, Rico. Yeah, I, I actually have a question uh, to the uh, three people who uh, discussed um, what the enforcers had said about uh, regulation. And uh, I, I completely agree. I'm, I'm, an, uh, I'm an economist and I know there are limits to regulation. And the last round of regulation that was done about electricity and telephone a long time ago uh, was uh, there was heavy, uh, there was realization that there was an informational problem. That the regulator always suffered from less information than the firms that were being regulated. So, for instance, in the case of Japan, we're, at, we're trying to do co regulation and soliciting the uh, regulated firms to provide us with necessary information so we can make the right decision. And I completely agree, we should have sound economic analysis for regulation, but in order to do that, we need information. And I wonder how um, firms feel about this, that good regulation, in order to have good regulation, you agree that you need to be forthcoming with uh, information that you, you're willing to uh, have uh, tra some kind of transparency about what you're doing. Because that's important for successful in a, uh, regulation. And we know that from our past experiences, I think. Um, Kalani, would you, do you want to come back on that one or? Uh... Yeah, sure, I could. Um, and uh, I um, absolutely agree with Commissioner Aoki's point that um, there needs to be a collaborative and multi stakeholder discussion and engagement um, when considering um, sort of uh, rulemaking um, and, and uh, how do we go about on, on regulation and, trans and maintaining transparency in that. Uh, it, it is important. And I think we do need to have a dialogue of constructive engagement between all stakeholders with the regulators. Um, some examples of that we have seen of late have often been, um, um, so for in, uh, in India, for example, there have been um, market studies, which the CCI commissions in understanding um, sort of a specific market, and it has an active stakeholder discussion um, in, uh, in, in that process. Um, so that has sort of helped in having a more informed regulation. Um, and so while I also have the mic, and uh, I also wanted to flip this a little bit and ask a question to the regulators themselves on this, um, is um, in addition to sort of stakeholder consultation, when we talk about international coordination and collaboration, um, which is uh, always good policy, um, Commissioner Wilson um, has particularly been a very active sort of participant in Indian competition policy discussions, um, and um, CCI has sort of mem uh, current cooperation agreements with the FTC and the EU, and that has helped a lot in um, having informed regulatory discussions. Um, but as we are moving, uh, as this panel sort of indicates how like this is a fairly contentious and somewhat divergent topic, on regulations. And I'm wondering how do you see sort of like international um, regulatory collaboration um, and uh, on baseline discussions, especially where um, there are sort of arguments to step away from economic evidence and analysis, which is sort of an objective baseline for most antitrust uh, policy approaches. And so how do you see and what is the value of um, those sort of uh, factors when looking at sort of a multilateral um, engagement on these issues? Hi, Mike. Hi, I mean, I'll come to Kalyani's point in, 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 a, in a moment. Can I just respond to a few points that have been made? Um, <clears throat> look, I, I agree with Christine that the history of regulation is not great for generating innovation absolutely but we're talking about rather old style regulation which is designed to uh to lock in the existing uh 
market power or the existing position of the regulated firms and then price regulate them or rate of return regulate them. That's absolutely not what we're trying to do with digital. Here we're trying to generate competition, not bake in the existing outcomes. So I'm much less concerned about the issue that you legitimately raise. That's one comment. Um, second comment is, I think Gonick made a point about competition law and it's a point a number of people have made, being, a, being able to work in this area. And, and I think it's really important to note that no one is suggesting we're going to replace competition law in the digital sphere. There's not very many firms in the, that are going to be designated designated as gatekeepers or as having significant market status. Most firms, digital firms, will continue to be subject to standard competition law. And, and note in the UK, you know, we've recently opened a couple of standard competition law cases. Um, these both public, one against Google, one against Apple. So I don't think anybody is suggesting moving away from competition law, but I think we are suggesting that you can't wholly rely on it in some cases just because it, it takes too long. And, you know, if we think about the FTC case against Facebook, you know, I'm no expert on legal timelines in the US, but Bill Kovacic, who is, reckons that'll come to court in the US in 2023, get to Supreme Court maybe 2026 for behaviour that is going back nearly a decade from now. I'm sorry, that is not timely intervention. Um, so, I, I, you know, so competition law is still important, but it's absolutely not enough. And then I think just a couple of points to raise from Kalyani. Look, I absolutely agree with your comment about flexibility. You know, whatever we do, has to, there has been an element to suck it and see. And regulators will make mistakes. Of course, regulators will make mistakes, you know, in the same way that, that companies make, make mistakes. So I think that's really important that everybody is clear that we're going to have a system of, you know, here's some suggestions. We have a discussion about them. We trial them or some version of them. And then we adapt them if they don't work. I think that that's really important. And then, although I've got a lot of other stuff I could say, but one final comment, you know, Kalyani, if I didn't, if I suggested in any way that I don't think these companies produce great products, then absolutely you should take me to task because we all know they produce great products. And I normally start my presentations by saying that, you know, that's a given, you know, that however, isn't enough to get you out of jail free in terms of competition policy. Um, and I think I'll, I'll shut up there. Thank you. So, Alison, just a, a couple of points. So um, with respect to regulation, I hear Mike's point. Let me just share an experience from the United States. When we talk about surgical regulation, it's what we tried to do with railroads in the United States. And we said, we're very concerned about competition among railroads. And, and so we started regulating railroads. And then we learned, lo and behold, that trucking competes with railroads. And so we had to expand the regulatory framework uh, to encompass trucking. And then we discovered lo and behold, barges compete with trucking, compete with railroads. And so we expanded the regulatory framework uh, to, to encompass barges. And so we ended up regulating a significant uh, chunk of the economy, uh, of, of the transportation economy, in an attempt to, uh, to capture all of the, and address all of the unintended consequences of regulating a very surgical area in the beginning. It's sort of like a balloon, right? If you push in one side, it's going to come out the other. And so uh, you have to encompass the efforts to capture all of the unintended consequences. Uh, and so I, I am not sure that regulation can be surgical. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure that regulation can achieve the goals that it seeks. Um, in, in particular, we, we have a significant economic debate over aero versus Schumpeter and where innovation comes from. And there seems to be an assumption that innovation only comes from small companies and new entrants. Certainly innovation can come from, uh, from nascent competitors, but it also comes from the larger companies who are investing millions, billions of dollars in R&D. Um, in, in terms of timing, yes. The Facebook case and other cases are going to take a long time to litigate. I think that's important to preserve due process and, uh, and to protect the rights of, of defendants in the United States. You are innocent until proven guilty. And so uh, for that reason, I am concerned about interim measures. Uh, and uh, although I certainly understand the urgency that people are describing, but, um, but at least in the United States, the proposals that are being discussed are not limited to the tech sector. We are 
talking sweeping changes across the entire economy. And so I think it is worth taking the time to make sure that we are getting these, uh, getting these measures right. I think it's worth taking the time to see whether uh, the, the existing cases are going to produce laudable outcomes before we give up on antitrust law as it currently exists. Uh, and with respect to the urgency that, that is driving people, obviously there are concerns about network effects and tipping, but I would note TikTok added a billion users in a year. And so I am perhaps a little more skeptical uh, about, um, about tipping and, uh, and sort of monolithic incumbents who can't be challenged at all. And then finally, uh, to Kalyani's question about stepping away from economics, uh, look, in the United States, one of the reasons I am so confident about the ability of the antitrust laws to address dynamic markets is that we tether our antitrust enforcement, at least to date, very closely to economic analysis. And economic analysis continues to uh, to evolve. And as our fellow panelists from Turkey noted, you know, we have introduced so many new concepts into antitrust law and the antitrust dialogue based on the characteristics that we are seeing in digital markets today. Uh, and it's not just in the United States, these are a topic of conversation with regulators around the world. And so our economic analysis is evolving and we are bringing cases against the largest incumbents. Uh, and for that reason, I do believe that antitrust law is sufficient uh, to to address these issues, but at the same time, I think it is imperative that we continue to tie antitrust enforcement to economic fundamentals. Without it, we have politicization, we have a vilification of companies that have fallen out of favor, uh, and, and we have subjectivity in antitrust enforcement that doesn't provide the predictability and certainty that you need to, uh, to incentivize investment in, uh, in the economy. very much for that. I think it, we've got um, tw 20 minutes or so left. So I, um, I'd be in some, invite some members of um, the audience to, to pose some questions. Um, Ashley, is, is, am I best to, uh, do you, are you going to moderate this or shall I just ask away? I'll just moderate the technical side. Uh, but yes, we do have received a number of questions and the most important question is from Jan Gutmann. Um, so Yann is head of digital economy uh, unit at the French Autorité de la Concurrence. Yann, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the interesting discussion between the panelists. Can you hear me well? And so uh, my question is one solution to tend to harmonize regulation regarding digital platform could be to define a set of general principles on which all the different stakeholders could agree. And so on your opinion, uh, what could be this uh, set of principles? For example, should we aim for actual competition in the market or only potential contestability of the market and so on? But maybe it's an impossible task because uh, when we see the difference of view among the panelists, so that's my question. Um, Alison, if you like, I, I'd like to uh, say a couple of words on this. <sighs> Um, so it, you know, it's it's a noble attempt, obviously, to to try and at least come up with a common ground. Uh, a, a search for common ground is always a good thing um, in all kinds of uh, uh, controversies. But then on this one, a one size fits all kind of an approach does not seem to to be very likely or or uh, not a likely candidate to be fruitful either. I'd say that uh, this is particularly because um, when you come up with that kind of an approach, so here are the principles, these are truths that we uh, all believe in, and uh, we're not going to discuss it any further. This is pushing you toward a um, um, per se type approach in uh, markets that are so quickly evolving that you want to actually look into the specific dynamics of each market. The TikTok example uh, was wonderful. I also uh, was um, uh, relieved to hear that uh, there are still people who believe that a uh, monolithic uh, uh, um, uh, tipping uh, uh, approach, a, a monolithic uh, 
uh, uh, uh, current uh, uh, um, incumbent approach is not really uh, uh, the way to go because uh, the more we come up with easy labels, the more we come up with bright line uh, rules that you cannot discuss anymore, the more we're going to uh, create a landscape that is not easy to build on. It's not going to be uh, that fertile anymore uh, for people who are trying to uh, innovate. Uh, so basically a, a one size fits all approach is just a pretty name for regulation itself. That's what regulation is. Uh, and uh, when discussing uh, whether regulation could stifle innovation, uh, if we're all saying it is a possibility, um, uh, then relieving ourselves from all those worries by saying all we're doing is um, uh, agreeing on certain general principles that we all agree on uh, won't, uh, won't make much sense. It's just going to mean that uh, we are coming up with regulation. We're just not calling it regulation. Anybody else want to comment on that, Mike? <laughs> I mean, it's not a, it's not a principle, but it, it is a test. I think the key thing we should be asking ourselves with any regulatory intervention here is, does this make it easier for firms to come in with good ideas and compete without being bought up or squashed or in some sense sidelined through sort of development type strategies? You know, that's my big principle. You know, can we allow new firms to come in? Can we enhance contestability and competition in the marketplace? I wonder whether I could take the questions out of order here, because I think Luke Peepercorn raised a question um, along these lines. Um, Luke, on, on, in relation to um, um, Mike Walker's last comments. Um, Luke, do you want to ask your question? Sorry, Alison, I couldn't catch the name. Uh, Luke. Oh, okay. Yes. okay, okay. Um, okay, so I have given the floor to Lucas. And so he's a professor at the Brussels School of Competition and College of Europe. You have the floor. Yes, thank you. Um, the comparison is often made for the need for ex ante regulation for the digital markets with the um, more traditional sectors like telecoms, etc. And in the telecom sector or in, 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 in electricity sectors, et cetera, we had a clear reason to, to know why there was a natural monopoly and why we wanted to have ex ante regulation. There was an indispensable input which you could not reproduce. Um, in the digital sector, it seems that uh, this is a bit less clear cut. And as far as I can see, there are two elements which are always brought up. One is the, the uh, economies of scale and scope that data accumulation give. And the other one is uh, 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 the possibility of having indirect network effects as, a, um, as, an, uh, as an entry barrier. And my question is to the panelists, what do they think are the most important? Is it more the data accumulation economies of scale or is it more the, uh, uh, the possibility of indirect network effects that they're worried about? that uh, makes those positions uh, unassailable. And if it is the data ac uh, accumulation, would it not be logical to look for a solution of data sharing, like um, you had with network sharing, uh, uh, access to, to um, electricity networks, et cetera. And if you think that it is more the, 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 uh, the indirect network effects, does that mean that the main emphasis should be on making sure that multi-homing remains possible because as long as multi-homing is possible and is practiced, does that not undermine the assessment of this kind of unassailable uh, positions? Um, and I'm asking because I presume that the traditional approach of antitrust to try to de-link all kinds of services in ecosystems is difficult to operate because those ecosystems seem to be necessary partly in order to finance 
some essential facilities inside the network, which do not itself provide uh, money, but the monetization is done through the ecosystem uh, 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 configuration. That was my question. Like to, uh, well, I, I'm happy to, but equally happy somebody else to. Uh, Christine, did you want to? What did you raise? Uh, I so just a couple of quick thoughts. I mean, you are absolutely right that that there is an ongoing conversation about how to address uh, the the issue, regardless of what the cause is. And so, do we revive the essential facilities doctrine and require access? Do we impose obligations of interoperability? Do we allow consumers to take their data uh, to other platforms and multi-home? I think all of those have incentives uh, and disincentives uh, that, that we need to consider. So for example, essential facilities. I am concerned that if we revitalize the essential facilities doctrine in the United States, we're essentially going to disincentivize R&D and investment because, uh, because then we're, we're essentially uh, allowing free riding on others' investments. Uh, interoperability may be useful to consider, but I, I would rather that it be uh, undertaken uh, voluntarily by companies rather than imposed by the government. And some of those efforts are, are underway in industry. And then in terms of uh, data portability, um, I, I think this is uh, probably the, the least problematic in terms of the incentives that it creates, you know, allow consumers to take their data uh, to, to other platforms and facilitate multi-homing, which can, of course, allow, allow more competition. There are privacy concerns to the extent that the user is exporting data, not just for himself, but for uh, all of those in, in his circle. And so all of those, I think, have consequences and ramifications to uh, to consider. And then I, I would say the, the last point I would make with respect to data, and this goes back to a point that Kalyani raised, I think at least in the United States, it's incredibly important to pass federal privacy legislation. There are currently few limits on the information that be, can be collected and how it can be shared, used, monetized, and sold. And I think that imposing limits on on data collection and use through federal privacy legislation could actually help create some breathing room for nascent competitors in in this space and so i think it would be beneficial not just from a privacy perspective but also from a competition perspective thank you very much for that before the others come in could i just ask um simonetta um Bezozo to ask a question because i think it's related to what Commissioner Wilson has just said, and then perhaps um, I know Elizabeth, um, you want to come back in. Um, we could perhaps wrap up some of the points together. So we have given you the floor, um, Simonetta. You should be able. Yeah, you have unmuted yourself. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so it seems we have an issue with her mic. Uh, I don't know if you want to read the question out loud, uh, Alison. Uh, yes, or we could ask Anastasia to come in because she's got okay. a similar question, I think. Okay. Okay, Anastasia, Hello. you have the floor. Yes. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Um, so there has been a growing apprehension that sometimes at some point the competition and so the privacy will collide to each other and it will not be uh, serving well for both the competition world and also the privacy side. So if the competition erodes privacy and while the privacy causes the competition, so which actually one of the two, the panelists think it will be more worth saving. So I think that's... Uh, all for me. Thank you so much for this interesting discussion. Thank you. And just to add that Simonetta's um, question was also was really about sort of the integration of competition and data protection. So, um, so it relates to Commissioner Wilson was talking about the need for greater privacy rules, but can privacy actually rules create competition law problems as well? So, um, Elizabeth, do you want to? Um, start with that. Um, uh, 
yeah, I was about to come into something else, but uh, the, the 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 privacy and, and the competition issue. Um, I, I think from um, economic point of view, um, privacy. If privacy is a dimension of platform differentiate themselves from comp competition, then that is a natural connection between the privacy and uh, antitrust law. But if it's purely how uh, the platform uh, organize and operate, uh, maybe there's some merit of separating competition issue from the pure data privacy issue. Um, I, I want to come back to uh, the earlier discussion that actually uh, Commissioner Rico was raised <laughs> at the very beginning. I wasn't get a chance to, to, to answer that. That is um, data. I mean, many of uh, the issues we're talking about, how data uh, user uh, uh, skill or economic skill, economic scope, how important entrenched they are, that all need to come back with what data we can collect and how what the reality was telling us because different platform have indeed very different need of what kind of data um, it, it requires. And uh, some platform, they may have very well, have a uh, very big economic scale and network effect, but others may not. Um, I, I keep coming back to my daughter's experience of social media needs. And she and her teenage girls and uh, switching their um, social media apps so often because uh, when when they were the first on the Facebook, um, they uh, nobody else is on it, and they have a group of close people. And then when the parents are on, they want to go away. They want to go to Snapchat, so they want they don't want their parents to see their uh, their their chats. So uh, what does it mean to have the uh, a user stickiness to have the, the skills necessary to build a new platform uh, that is highly complex and uh, we do need data support and Rico was absolutely right how do you do a good regulation or uh, do, do, without data we economists can work with regulators and we can design a, a reasonable and effective way of collecting the right data to help you design a, a good regulation. That's where I think uh, is the first step. Let's understand what market looks like, and then um, maybe think about what are the ways we can help facilitate innovation and and, um, and the competition. So sorry about the long answer. Thank you very much. I think you've just got two more minutes. So I, um, Mike, Mike. So Kevin. Just quickly go back to the privacy question, which is, I think, a really important question, but I don't think it's either privacy or competition. But what is really important is that privacy regulators and competition authorities work together um, because we know that privacy regulation has been used by some platforms as a, as a shield. GDPR definitely has been used as a shield to protect some of the platforms from competition. Um, but it's not a question, I think, of competition authorities thinking, no, it's a privacy, not our problem, or privacy regulators thinking it's competition policy, not our problem. Absolutely, we have to work together. Privacy is a very important dimension of competition. It matters a lot to consumers, so we have to protect it. But, you know, we can do that without damaging competition, and that requires regulators to work together, which in the UK, that's what we do. We spend a lot of time talking to the Information Commissioner's Office to try and make sure that we are in sort of the same place on these issues. And then one final comment on that. I do think it's an interesting observation that we haven't seen competition in privacy in any of these markets. And actually, I think that's one of the things that suggests to me there is there's something going wrong in some of these markets, because you would expect if privacy matters to consumers as much as it, as it appears to, that we should have seen firms competing in terms of the privacy settings they offer. We've not seen that at all. Thank you very much. Well, I think we're um, out of time now. Um, so I would just like to thank the panel very much indeed for your very interesting presentations and, and, and reflections. Um, and I will hand back to uh, Concurrence. Thank you very much, um, everybody, for the questions. And thank you to our speakers, uh, Reiko, Ganench, Kalyani, Mike, 
Elizabeth, Christine, and Allison for such an interesting and engaging discussion. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know me, my name is Ariel Salvaro, and I'm an events coordinator at Concurrence, uh, just here for a few final points. Uh, so we will continue the debates on the regulation of platforms tomorrow with the third webinar of the conference, uh, which is focusing on what's holding back the EU and UK from creating platforms. Uh, speakers will be Sarah Ashtel from Sherman and Sterling, uh, Sar Dierkins from Siemens, uh, Chris, Kirsten Edwards Warren from Compass Lexicon, uh, Sophia Real from Google, Pierre Gibault, who's a chief economist with DigiComp, uh, and moderator will be uh, Bill Kovacic, uh, professor at King's College London, and executive director at CMA and professor at George Washington University. Uh, this is now the end of today's webinar. Thank you very much again to our speakers, our partners, and all of you for joining. Uh, we are just going to leave the link for your certificate of attendance in the chat for the next two minutes so you can get it. Um, and we hope to welcome all of you again uh, at our future uh, webinars. If the speakers would like to say their final goodbyes, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much again to our panel. Thank you. And to Concurrence for your uh, very efficient organization and help. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.